it's Lessons for Life, and a couple of days ago we passed an important anniversary. It clashed with Karl Marx's birthday, so I focused on that, but I didn't want to miss addressing the anniversary of the death of MP Bobby Sands, who in 1981, 39 years ago, passed away after 66 days of hunger strike. And I've got a friend of the channel and personal friend of mine, uh, Brian. He's phoning me from Ireland and he's something of an expert on Irish history. And you were just saying, Brian, you were young at the time and you can vaguely remember the black flags flying in remembrance of Bobby Sands. Welcome it's, back, mate. Thank you. My, um, that would be my, my reaction. Like, the one thing I remember was that because there was actually a couple of families that had come from the six counties um, during the pogroms in the late 60s and they'd settled in Waterford. And this is when... Uh, they had the black flags. And then kind of traditional Republican families had the black flags here. So, late 60s... Catholic areas were burnt out by loyalist uh, mobs uh, and people had to flee. Yeah. Is that right? So that's right. You had a lot of people. Like, um, there's a town in Clare. It's called Shannon Town. And it's basically, we'll say, 60% of the town in, by the airport, Shannon Airport, is uh, from uh, Belfast. Really? And these are refugees in a way or internally displaced people that was it was i suppose you could call it internal displacement because you know it's it's one island like but um that's why i, I was careful with my language there because some people think <laughs> that uh the 26 county are the are a completely different entity but uh yeah. from if you're of a nationalist mind and i'm also reluctant to use the religious language because it was people targeted for their religion or religious background but the republican movement has never spoken in terms of sectarian language and we said before there's always been and will always be uh, protestant irish nationalists and bobby sands himself was even of a mixed background i believe his grandfather uh, was a protestant who was felt as betrayed by the british state uh, as any catholic on the island of ireland uh, might have my, like my uh, my great grandfather was uh, Protestant as well. Uh, the, the six county in particular, there's, there's a lot of cross marrying, and, and it wasn't so much a problem in a lot of areas. I mean, if you look at where Bobby was born, Raccoon. Raccoon was um, a mixed area. There was he was brought up in tenements that were built there, and he was on a football team that was a mixed football team. He ran with the Rakul Harriers, I think they were. They were the Lennox Club. You know, he was he was kind of an apolitical kid. He just wanted to play football and do athletics. And things started to change in towards the late sixties. And in the Rakul area, there was a group called um, the K uh, KAIs, and they were these guys in tartan pants and. Uh, um, denim jackets and they'd march in formation can you hear me yeah 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 I'm with you I'm with you, yeah. Thank you. they'd march in formation up and down the street you know the KAIs um, was kill all Irish it was just wow. a gang they were kind of like um, they were, and they wore tartan are they, these are tartan gangs did, did they also call them tartan gangs wow. hair and pants on and kind of uh, denim jackets or army jackets wow they march around so when trouble started in the late 60s, Rakul had a small nationalist Catholic population living in the area, you know. And what they used to have was Bobby's experience of the, his first experience of the fact that he was different was that his neighbor's house, there was a Catholic family. And um, one night, this woman came up with a young couple and they walked up and they went into their neighbor's house they were, they didn't go into indoors they just started looking in the windows they were looking at the garden they were checking the house out and these people kind of got the nickname of being loyalist estate agents what the woman was doing was showing them this house and was saying to, to this young couple well you know what do you want that house 
you want that house, we'll give it to you. And we'll get the family that's in it out. So this all started happening. You had all these marching up and down the street, singing sectarian songs. And then Bobby himself, he was, he was I think he was working with the Belfast bus, city bus. And um, I think his father worked there before him. And one day he was opening up his locker and there was a bullet in the locker uh, with a message kind of basically telling them to, to get lost. Wow. So this, these are these kind of formative years and experiences. So after that, um, he, started, he started becoming more political, obviously. I think that would politicise anyone. But what made a, an integrated area like that with people playing on mixed football teams and even mixed marriages. Why did it descend into sectarianism? I've heard loyalists blame the civil rights movement as if people demanding equality was bound to annoy someone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. They have this kind of upside-down view of the world in some ways, you know, the very staunch loyalist... Uh, Apologists, like you know, they they can't have it both ways. I mean, they, they at the time they were afraid. Like I mean, in the nineteen fifties, there'd been the border campaign, and the border campaign was very hadn't been a success. Um, so the fear, the fear of the IRA was, didn't seem much. The IRA didn't have the ability to to. Um, change events in the six counties. Mm. They didn't have that ability. They didn't have that support. But then, this happened. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, it was, it, was, it was civil rights. It was the failure to allow for a university in Derry City that pushed a lot of people to, towards uh, the civil rights movement that kind of started the rights movement. I mean, if the, if, if the storm had given the university that I think they put in Coleraine and they put it in uh, Derry, there may not have been a civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement was a non-violent movement, from what I understand, civil disobedience inspired by the likes of Rosa Parks and the black civil rights movement in America. Yeah, and I mean, it, was, it, it, it had a broad spectrum of people involved. I mean, you had people from Protestant people, you had Catholic people, you had leftists, you had church people, you had, you know, there was a, it was a broad spectrum. I mean, you you obviously would have had people from a Republican background. It was it was such a, a, a wide net that it cast. But it's... Um, but well, it, the, the quote I've got on the screen now, Brian, I, if I just... Sorry to interrupt. I've got the quote on the screen that says, everyone, Republican or otherwise, has his or own part to play. And that is... Attributed to Bobby Sands. Yeah, I mean, if you think about um, Bobby's legacy, when you think about republicanism, Irish republicanism, uh, if you're coming from a, an internationalist point of view in terms of socialists as well, mm. I mean, there's two names jump out from Irish republicanism as kind of socialist thinkers, as political thinkers, as as people who would influence beyond the border of Ireland, of beyond the island of Ireland, and that would be, you know, Bobby Sands and James Connolly. Yes. And those two people, that sort of very similar people in terms of, I mean, Bobby probably wouldn't have started out as a Marxist, he wouldn't have started out as a socialist, but Long Cash and the H-Box and these prison camps became universities, almost like the Sorbonne, you know, in Paris, you know, in 68, they became these kind of hotbed of political discussion and Bobby and, and people like that in the prisons became almost disenchanted with the old Republican old Republicans and they began to, to generate a lot more of a push towards different political philosophies and terms of well, leftist philosophies so they, they would have read books about Mao, you know Ho Chi Minh, they would have been looking at Leninist, Trotsky Trotskyists, they would have looked at different philosophies and eventually arrived at something that 
didn't just molded kind of republicanism with this Marxist leftist ideology, which you would think, in terms of the hit, the real history of republicanism, that that is an all encompassing non sectarian view. If you get me. Yes, so of, of course. You know, that, so that's where, and then, you know, that kind of sits back to that. There's been moments in the history of the six counties uh, there where there's been opportunities that weren't taken, where you could have united people under a banner of socialism rather than the separate banners of Catholicism and Protestantism or unionist and nationalist. Yeah, div- divide and conquer. And it was, exactly, and it wasn't taken. And, uh, this is much for the nationalist community to be blamed for that. Uh, you know, no one should be a person blamed for that. It's just it was an opportunity lost. But there's always been strong Presbyterian Republicans, Protestant Republicans in Belfast, and even up in the 1930s, there was a group. They were called a special group, and they um, they basically were leftists, communists, mm-hmm. and they lived in East Belfast and they lived on the Shankill. And they were trusted with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, operations because they were not untouchable, but they didn't rouse the same suspicion as notable volunteers from West Belfast and from Ardoin. So they weren't, you know, under the same kind of pressure. So they were given a lot of work to do, but kind of. The early days of the troubles kind of changed everything when you got into this kind of tit for tat thing, and, and, I, and I, I do believe, you know, from reading Bobby Sands and that, that he, he and a lot of the, um, the Republican leadership were against that, and they didn't want that. But it was almost like it's it's that kind of thing that when it it starts, it's impossible to stop it. I've, I've heard people coined the term defenderism as in it was people reverting back to what the defenders were who were an agrarian Catholic uh, defence association you could say rather than the United Irishmen who were an all encompassing and largely Protestant in origin Presbyterian in in particular organisation but yeah that's the that's the divide and conquer I do always uh, like to remind people there have always been um Republicans from from all backgrounds, and I'm trying to. The name escapes me. Who founded the INLA? Uh, uh, Bun, Ronnie Bunting was it, was he of a Protestant background? Very good question, you know. I'm not sure. Uh, some of these hardcore leftists would have been, um, uh, as you say, politics b- uh, before religion. But let, let's get into the prison now. What was going on in the prison? You said people were learning. I know people were studying language. The Irish language was alive. They call it the the jail tuft. Yeah, it was. It was. It became a, like a university, like any kind of fervent mm. leftist university in Europe at the time. Mm. I mean, that's a lot of the reason that you had people, you know, beyond Ireland became interested in people like Bobby Sands and they, and and their struggle. Because they identified with that that same kind of politics, yeah. maybe not with the Irish, with the nationalism or the republicanism, but they definitely the universities became these hotbeds for. Okay, well, what are we doing here? We're fighting for what? We're fighting for civil rights, and we fighting for United Ireland. But if we get United Ireland, what what's that going to look like? What, what will that look like? Uh, um, the Ireland, where the captains of industry get to do what they want, and the landlords keep screwing everyone, um, or is it going to be the workers' paradise? You know, is it going to be what the lads, what they, what they kind of uh, the socialist utopia? And that's the kind of thing that was happening in prisons at the time. What you do know, you have this big discussion going on? What do you think? Bobby's vision of that United Ireland uh, would would have been. It you know like I mean you think a lot a lot of politicians go on or a lot of people go on a journey 
I mean, the likes of Bobby and that, they're these bright flames that burn very, very brightly and then they just, they burn out because they make that sacrifice Conley, people like that. And other people take on their name and they, they run with it. And they use that name and they use that person's legacy to kind of further their own political beliefs. Mm. I mean, the Bobby Sands of the 70s and, and the early 80s was a person who believed in a redistribution of wealth and land and, and a, a push for a more equal society. Now, had Bobby survived and had he grown over the years, would he remain that, um, you know, holding on to that Marxist ideal to the bitter end? Or would he become a more pragmatic kind of person? Uh, would he have gone down the route of Mary McGuinness and Jerry Adams? That's a question we'll never know. I think, you know, the men who are prepared to die, usually if they are more hardened in their beliefs, they're not going to make that pragmatic step. So I think like what, what he wanted was, was was an Ireland that was, you know, possibly looking like a democrat a more democratic version of of Cuba, like you know, less um you know I don't know what he would have envisaged a central committee looking after the country or a democracy where you just had leftist parties to pick from. I don't know. Well, I was just thinking it's sometimes I know you say that the hardliners are willing to die, but sometimes it's the moderates who other people allow them to die. And in the end, Bobby Sands was allowed to die by uh, Margaret Thatcher. I'm thinking of Michael Collins, who said that he signed his own death warrant. And even in the Middle Eastern conflict, I can think of uh, presidents who have been assassinated for not being extreme enough. Sometimes yeah. the people that take the middle road make the ultimate uh, sacrifice. That's true, that's true as well. I mean, I think it's the most honest type of people usually end up dead or in prison, you know. Um, the political survivors, the, the cute whores, as they call them in Ireland, they they manage their way to, to the finishing line and they pick up all the, all the gold. Well, the other poor devils that perhaps did all the, the struggling get left behind. I mean, there's always there's that issue in, in, the, in the six counties if you're, you know, there's people that feel very much left behind that they would cling, they would, they would say they have ownership over Bobby's legacy and they don't, they're not happy with the state of things. And then you have Sinn Féin and Sinn Féin claim Bobby's legacy and they're pushing their political All-Ireland agenda. And then you have the, you know, the, the more distant groups that would also claim it. And do, do you think there's anyone that can rightfully lay claim to his legacy? I think the, I think you know, I think Bobby Sands' legacy belongs to the people of Ireland, and no political party has has any kind of right to him. I mean, obviously the main, the liberal, neoliberal mainstream parties in the southern part of the country don't want to be associated with them because it brings up uncomfortable questions and uncomfortable discussions. But, you know, leftist parties and leftist people, he, he belongs to them. He belongs to that idea that you have an Ireland that's going to be just an equal, where our workers' rights will be respected. Now, you won't be in the middle of a, we'll say for an example, uh, to, to use a uh, recent news, you won't be bussing in or uh, sending a, bringing in a Ryanair flight of Bulgarian workers to pick your strawberries uh, and treating them like dirt in the middle of a, an, uh, an epidemic or pandemic. You know what I mean? That's that that or that kind of or you know, and then shoving you know forty foreign national workers into a, um, a, a two-bedroom house 
in the, in the, in the, on the outskirts of Dublin to make as much money as you can out of people. You know, our, you know, the Bewley's workers all being laid off today, for, you know, the, Dublin's oldest tea house, mm-hmm. all being laid off today because Johnny Ronan, who owes, who uh, went bankrupt during the, the crash, wants uh, his rent to be continued to be paid. Um, so the co- it's forcing the company to shut down. You know what I mean? The, these rich captains of industry, the William Martin Murphys, the, all these, these people, you know, they are in direct opposition to the, the Ireland that Bobby Sands wanted. Yeah. Well, so, just our, it, was a, it was an Ireland that was going to, you know, be one youth for, for, for the youth. And it didn't come to be, obviously, because poor, well, poor, poor man. Basic. Thank you, Brian. I don't want, I don't want to take too much of your, your uh, time tonight. I just want to remind us all that there were nine other brave men that followed behind him and Bobby was just the first one to go and he said I know I will die but I hope I'm I'm the only one so he's always been the name that uh, we remember the most perhaps but nine others followed him and they were fighting for a united Ireland we haven't got there yet and if we do I hope it doesn't look like the picture you're describing uh, of the free state, uh, as they would uh, as they would call it. What vision? What hope is there for realizing their uh, wishes? And how will it look in reality? Yeah, well, I, yeah. I tell, look. This is the thing. I mean, you have a strange alliances after United Ireland that will seem impossible. But just, I mean, to to say in Irish politics, you have Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, two parties that would have declared themselves polar opposites, you know, or having a, a very bizarre wedding and marrying each other in this coalition, which is very neoliberal based and in order to keep Sinn Féin out. And consequently, I think they made Sinn Féin the opposition party. And yeah, that, that, was, that was amazing. In the next, yeah, in the next election, I would see Purely because neoliberalism is uh, mismanages every single resource in your country, so it destroys things. It can't help itself. So, as a political philosophy, it just upsets people. And I think because of that, Sinn Féin will see themselves coming to power in the next after the next election. And. That'll be an interesting time because, like, what kind of Ireland are they going to build? Are they going to hold? Are they going to stay true to? I mean, Sinn Féin probably more than any other party use Bobby Sands' image because it's it's an international image. It's an image that is, you know, streets in Tehran, streets in Brittany, yeah. all named after Bobby Sands. Revolutionaries read about them. They they read his writing. Now some people would read Lenin or Trotsky or and stuff like that. So. You know, I mean, my my, I've got friends in who are in prison, and one of the books in Palestine on their wing. One of the books they have is Bobby Sands' book. You know, so he has an international dimension to him. Will Sinn Féin stay true to that to that dream that he has? Will they have to be more pragmatic? Will they have to buy into like a lot of leftist governments do, like in Greece, to the, to the IMF's way of doing things. Are we on the verge of seeing a kind of a, a, the world turning against that liberal vision, you know? I, say, I sense that you're, I sense you're reluctantly accepting that Sinn Féin are the only party who can lay claim to his legacy. You spoke to George Galloway shortly after the uh, Sinn Féin uh, brilliant performance in the in the election, and he was very impressed with what you said. George Galloway is in the midst of starting a new Workers' Party in really? in Britain. Yes, a new leftist party. Do you think there is the need for a new party that could carry the mantle of Bobby Sands in Ireland, or will Sinn Fein do if they stay true uh, to their word and their roots? I can't fault Sinn Féin's logic. If you're a dissident, I can understand dissidents. I can understand why they're annoyed. 
I mean, the, the Good Friday Agreement is the Sunningdale Agreement. Yeah. And if you accept it, that the Good Friday Agreement's okay, what was wrong with the Sunningdale Agreement? And why were we fighting for an extra 20 years? So I can see where this is coming from. I can see that the objectives of the IRA haven't been obtained. However, the Sinn Féin strategy has always been, I would say, a little bit more pragmatic and long-term in terms that they see a political advancement in the 26 counties and being power-sharing in the, in the six counties means that over the whole, the entirety of the island, they are the most formidable force. Fine Gael know this, Fianna Fáil know this, the DUP know this. They know that this entity, this that is Sinn Féin, has the ability to become the most powerful political entity on the country, of the whole island. And because of that, they're very fearful, uh, very worried about it, because, you know, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, obviously, they have no footing in the six counties. Well, um... And the DUP have no footing in the southern counties. So, I mean, if you come to a United Ireland, Sinn Féin become um, a robust political powerhouse, much like Fianna Fáil were for the first seventy years of the of the of the, of the, the Free State and the Irish Republic. So th- there's fear of that. But will they deliver on what they promise? I think ideologically they are more likely to deliver than Fáil or Fine Gael. And Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have bought in completely to neoliberalism and neoliberal economics. So, if it came down to it, would Fianna Fáil be more likely to cooperate with Sinn Féin and have some kind of of a coalition than Fine Gael? I think grassroots members found it more palatable for Fianna Fáil to join Sinn Féin than to join Fine Gael. But they call themselves the United Ireland Party, don't they? Not that they've done much. In the way of making it happen, a case of uh, it was raise the green flag for votes. We're going to unite the, the country, lads. Okay. So you know we, we we'll get Brexit done. Like, they had no intention of it. But I think what you've put, picked up on something interesting there is that Fianna Fáil, uh, a lot of Fianna Fáil membership, grassroots people, may find Sinn Féin a more uh, ideologically uh, uh, similar to them than, you know, the Fianna Fáil, which is about to join Fine Gael right now. Mm-hmm. So I think they, I think you'll see a lot of def- defections from old school Republican Fianna Fáil supporters will jump ship and will support, especially in the next election, I think you'll see a lot of Fianna Fáil voters, Fianna Fáil's votes going to disappear. And it will go to Sinn Féin. <laughs> and um, all because their leader, Mian Martin, is just dying to be the Taoiseach. Okay. And um, he's not even going to be Taoiseach. I think he's going to be a revolving Taoiseach with Leo Varadkar, okay. which is just ridiculous and pointless uh, to in the extreme. But it's going to destroy Fianna Fáil, which means I can see a lot of Fianna Fáil votes, young Fianna Fáil voters just been absorbed into Sinn Féin and Sinn Féin becoming the largest party by the time the next election comes around. Wow. Well, look, Brian, here comes my final question. At the next election, how many seats in the Doyle do you think the DUP will win? <laughs> that's uh, my question. That's brilliant. Do you know what? I'd say they got a couple of seats in, uh, in, in certain parts of Dublin. Well, okay, yeah, that's it's it's funny, but they'd be better off surely, uh, being a quarter of the Doyle or or a fifth or whatever they'd be than being a tiny little proportion of the UK Parliament debating issues that have nothing, uh, to do with their people in their everyday lives. Yeah, absolutely. That it makes perfect sense to you, to me, yeah. but when your whole identity is the flag and the crown. I mean, I just can't see them buying into it. I mean, they have to. I mean, 
really they they're a conservative Fine Gael. Like Fine Gael are very, I would say, you know, they're liberal on social issues only because it suits them. Um, they're Fine Gael are very neoliberal. They believe in the free market. I mean, they're they've undertaken the most. They've turned Ireland into the most open market, free market country in Europe, I'd say, in the so last where, 10 years. Where is this left-wing republic that people fought so hard for and, and died for? Where Where is it? Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, every time you have a, a revolution, immediately after that revolution, you either take complete control and you impose your will or the bankers, the newspaper men, the landowners, the factory owners, they all come back in. Like, they will they will go on the run for a year or two, but they'll come back in and they'll cash in. It happens every single time. Like, William Martin Murphy was a citizen of the British Empire, and then he was a citizen of the Free State, and nothing changed. There was, yeah. you know, it, 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 he was still part of the problem that was Ireland in the 1920s you know uh, a land a landlord uh, you know just because the, the state had changed its name didn't mean that these people had disappeared Absolutely. they still exploited workers they still went after people okay. I mean that's the key thing like if Sinn Féin did win would we be seeing a situation where our, and here's the thing like you know Ireland's become so middle class you know that it wants things it desires things so for example like you know people want their keeling strawberries does it matter if they've been picked by somebody who's on minimum wage or does it matter that it's been picked by somebody who's been paid half the minimum wage but it's because they're from another country you know what I mean it all comes down to a sense of what what do you want as a, as a country? I mean, the changes that the world is going to experience in the next 20 years, Bobby Sands' view of the world is going to suit that better, I think, than I hope so. the, you know, the, the political opposites, the neoliberal ones, because the neoliberalism is destroying the planet. It's, it's, creating, a, it's creating thousands of Chernobyls in terms of health epidemics and famines all over the world. So I think people, now that the bubble has been burst in the West with this virus, I think you're going to see a lot more people going towards Bobby Sands rather than Boris Johnson or Leo Varadkar's vision. I hope so. And he said our revenge will be our children's laughter, right? He was thinking about the next generation. And those children are parents themselves now. And it's uh, it saddened yes. me to think Bobby has now been dead longer than he lived. Uh, yes. he, he was in his 20s when he, when he passed away. And my goodness, the world has changed. I just hope we can embrace his vision of what a world uh, might be like. Brian, I really appreciate the call, my friend. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jim. It's always good talk. Wonderful. Well done, mate. Thank you very much. We'll have a, we'll have a chat with ourselves over the weekend, all right? Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, brother. Cheers, brother. Slug of all. Thank you, brother. Slug of There goes Brian. Yeah. My goodness. It, uh, what a world it is. And... How much has changed since 1981? I was born in the 80s. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago. But uh, the world has changed. The world has got smaller. Um, and we need to change the system. Bobby Sands had a different idea in mind. And I think we can um, do justice to his legacy if we if we take a leaf out of his book. Thank you for joining me tonight. It's been an important one uh, for me. I know it's quite specific, but I couldn't let the anniversary go by without commemorating the passing of Bobby Sands. So this has been Lessons for Life, and we will do it all again soon. Thank you for joining me. We were here, and we are gone. The latest. <laughs>